Hey guys, welcome to the shop, and man, do I think that I got a good video to share with you this week. What we are going to be doing is working on, it's a research project that involves a miniature size ball mill. It's for a research project, not going to get into what it's for, but we have to do some modifications to these big end pieces of this ball mill, the bronze bush carriers and end plates. You'll, you'll see. I think you'll find it interesting. I'm looking forward to doing it. I have also got some new tools that I want to share with you for the shop. I think they're neat and you may as well. First thing that I got to do is get this pickup out of the shop and then beep, beep, beep back the crew cab in here so we can get these big heavy pieces that we got to work on out of the truck. So thank you for watching and let's get started. So this is the old K10 that we built on the channel probably a year and a half, two years ago. The other day I was driving this thing, just pouring the coals to it, giving it the beans. I was playing, that's what I was doing, out on the out on these country roads around through here, and I started smelling antifreeze really, really heavy, and I was like, uh-oh, I did it now. And I thought maybe the rotor, radiator, radiator blew, blew a hose off or head gasket, I didn't know. And uh, come to find out, the heater core had started leaking on this thing and it had just soaked soaked all the carpet everything on the passenger side of this truck i was disheartened i got the interior ripped out of this thing right now um, all of the everything but the seat anyway and the dash in order to put a heater core in this thing it never ends it never ends let's see if this do to start All right. So I've got two of these end plates here. Now, if you don't know what a ball mill is, it's an industrial way to crush things. Actually, you can do it on a miniature scale. People uh, will run like pebbles and stones through a ball mill to smoothen smoothing make them smoother is smoothing a word i'm not for sure but you get the idea these go on the ends of a big metal tube inside of that tube is steel balls or whatever you want to put in there it rotates and it pulverizes crushes smashes destroys whatever you've got in that meal uh, these are the ends of that and they need some service work so let's get these out of the truck this is an old setup that needs to be modified for a new life. So this Caterpillar forklift is, is awesome. It makes stuff like this pretty, pretty easy. A one man job. So for anybody who's curious, old Johnny Cash, the crew cab dually that I built, put the 6 liter uh, LSN 4L80 transmission that I built for my wife, it's doing awesome. She drives this thing eh, a few times a week, a couple times a week anyway. That wasn't a fart, that was my arm on the... See, just trying to make sure you know. She drives this thing at least a couple times a week.
So let me give you a quick rundown on what we need to do to these, or at least what I know that we need to do at the moment. The first thing is to pull off this grate. There's also a strainer in here, and I'll show you. You'll get a good look at all this stuff. This is the outlet side of this ball mill. There's a strainer in here that keeps the balls in the mill from coming out of this side. This is the inlet side. Imagine these between two pieces of pipe sitting on these big carriers, bearing carriers, whatever you want to call it, and it rotating. You can see that this is in the form of a scoop. So this would sit down in a trough, and as this ball mill would rotate, this scoop would scoop up material and feed it, self-feed into this ball mill. It would go through, get pulverized by the balls, and then come out of this side. Well, it's not going to be used like that, you know, for the customer's intended purpose. So we need to do some modifications. So we need to pull this off, pull the grate off. This flange has to come off. We need to inspect the way that, I think these are bronze bushed. These bronze bush are connected to the carrier and make sure that they are greasable. Although there are grease fittings in the top here, uh, the customer said when he took that off, there was no hole down into the bearing area of this bearing. We need to inspect that. Also, I need to attempt to remove this scoop without damaging it because it potentially may be used in its current configuration down the road. I need to try to get this scoop off and do the exact same thing to this carrier as I do to this one. I also need to put a large hole in here, either 2 inch NPT or a, make a custom flange with a gasket. So drill through this either tap it for a bung, two inch MPT bung, or make a custom gasketed flange so this thing can be drained of its chemical or whatever they're going to solvent, whatever they're going to put in here, so it can be drained fully without having to remove these end caps to do so. So, let's start with the easy stuff, and that is get this grate off, get this strainer out, and then see if we can't get this flange off. So we're going to use the old DeWalt battery powered angle grinder can't beat these things. They do chew up batteries, but they're awesome because they're so mobile. And there's a few popcorn welds here, just spit and sputtered, kind of, not all the way around it, but you get the idea. We're going to cut this because all of this stuff needs to be saved. We're not trying to destroy anything, or, you know, we're just trying to dissect this, this part. Sixteenths. Hopefully, these will come off. I don't want to break if I break them. Anything, Ugh. I'd have to get it out. So, it's already missing one. So that grate looks like it is jammed in there with a bunch of sand and grit. So let's see if we can rattle its brains a bit. Get it to come, come out of there. I know it comes out this way, but just trying to see if I can knock the grid out of it. So now I need to get this flange um, off of this piece of pipe and it's screwed on and by the looks of the corrosion and stuff there's no way it's just going to be friendly and screw right off there. Uh, I thought I'd seen a set screw on the face of this as well and I'm not sure what that's all about but I'm sure it's going to involve the flame wrench. So that set screw there is four millimeter. And I know what's going to happen if I try too hard to get that out. So what I'm going to what I'm going to do is put a little heat on that. Hopefully it'll screw right out. What I think that's that set screws for is I think that it goes in. Probably has a little um, piece of brass or bronze or something in there that pushes against the thread. I'm thinking 
and locks this on. That's what I'm thinking. I'm going to get this out and then try to get this flange to screw off of here. So these Smith torches, they're like a Cadillac. From what I've worked with the majority of my life, just a pleasure to use. Let's see what we need. Let's use a number 206. That should put out decent heat. It's amazing what a little heat can do. Take something that you'd never get out otherwise and make it where it just comes right out. Now, hopefully this doesn't make me a liar, but I bet you it will. have some gunk in the threads at the end there. A little bit of juice. Why well, it's so hot, the juice just turns into smoke. She's coming out now. Ain't no way that would have come out without heat. These? One of them. Yeah, we'll we'll see how. Yeah, yeah. You got a you got that photo? Which? Mm -hmm. These were the bottoms, yeah. right? Yeah. You can see okay. They yeah. Them. Yeah. They they're directional, and that needs to go front to back. Was it? Yeah. And it's that one. And which other one's the directional? I'm not sure. It's over. So my buddy Matt stopped by. These are lower control arms for Volkswagen Beetle. What year is it? 68. Six, 1968. And we knocked the ball joints out and we are installing some new ones really quick. He wanted to borrow the press, so that's what we're going to do. Put in some new ball joints in his Beetle. These are not greasable. Hmm. Yeah, we'll just get set up and press those right in. I do. So that piece of pipe fits on that perfectly. So that'll give us a good way to push on it without damaging that, uh, that dust cap or whatever. And then we need something to set this on. Can we set that? That's kind of, we just need something to, piece of pipe, how big is that? Actually another piece of that would work, maybe something just a hair bigger. Those go in there pretty snug. They sure ain't falling out. <laughs> I 
Looks good. So you're just putting on the dust caps. They got to be put on afterwards. So I've never done a one of Volkswagen's ball joints before. <laughs> you thought this little spring part of it, yeah? Yeah. There's a trick we don't know, I think. <laughs> don't know the combination. Oh, buddy. <laughs> we did it. Mike, check. Say it. Say Mike, check. check. Say it again. Check the microphone. Check it. Check it, check it. So my buddy Matt's going to help me to get this flange off of here because it's really a, it's probably a two-person job. My plan is, because this is threaded on, I just got the, the one set screw out. I need to check in that hole and make sure there's not two set screws because that's got me uh, several times in the past. A set screw on top of a set screw, it happens and you got to make sure that there's not one underneath the first one. So I, I need to check this hole, make sure there's not a second set screw in it. If there's not, then I'm going to heat inside of here just to try to, you know, make it swell and contract a bit to break the bond, the rusty, crusty bond of these threads on here. Then I'll probably weld get something on here, an ear onto this flange is what I'm thinking, and then, uh, you know, maybe a hammer and just try to knock this flange, try to unscrew it with a little bit of force. Mm, there's something in there, but it's not a set screw. It's probably just a piece of brass or bronze, something that seats into that, pushes against that thread. So this thing doesn't come unscrewed while uh, the machinery is running. A lot of build up there. Yeah, maybe Hard that, uh, yeah, it's crusty. Whatever they was running through this thing was corrosive. this thing super hard just because I have to get it back off so hard enough to hopefully it'll hold and then I can easily grind it off once I'm done because they want to reuse that flange little spot off for the ground. Here. 
That worked perfect. Boom. That came off so much easier than I thought it would. There's that thing. Yeah. Little brass. Yep. Right there was what was locking the this onto the threads. Just a little it was copper or brass. So now we need to get this uh, carrier, whatever you want to call it. This one's got to come off of here. And I don't know how tough that's going to be. Grab that side and see if we can just kind of twist and lift. No, we're going to have to. It's not moving. Mm. Let me. Let me clean that up just a little, because that's awful rough. Oh, man. Boom. So that is a heck of a piece Wonder of bronze. If that's got threads in it, it turns. I, I don't know, buddy. I don't know how this is tied to the to the housing, but we got a thrust side here, so this goes against the ring on the thing. You see, it, it's the rut. this thing's been sitting for a very long time, but it doesn't look like it's maybe ever been used, or if it has, it hasn't been much. So we'll clean out all this old grease and stuff. See if I can find a way that this bush is attached to the actual bush holder mount whatever you want to call it and also I need to make sure that this bushing uh, is able to be greased through this fitting you know what those may be well no they're solid round I was about to say those may be uh, a grease hole no uh, a pin what a way to anchor it to the well, housing I think it may be it looks like a uh, uh, Allen rim or a set screw, but I don't no. see nothing in there. They're solid ram. Nothing in that one no. because we don't know who the even the owner of this doesn't know who made this unit, so there's no paperwork or anything on it. We can't see how it's supposed to be constructed, and that's why he's wanting me to clean these all up and investigate and get it into a condition where it you know it'll run and not give them any trouble. And this seems like this isn't lined up, so that's probably why it won't take any grease. Yeah, yeah. He said it wouldn't take, it would not take it grease, is. and that when he pulled this out, there was no hole yeah, directly. It's, it's all so, the way over here. Yeah, it looks like this bushing is maybe. Uh, it's probably been tried to been run dry, and it's twisted this bush in the housing because it may. Who knows? I don't see any way that this bush is anchored to this housing. Solid. Yep, so under that, this bush has rotated in the housing and it's no longer aligned with, there is a hole in the bush but where this bush is rotated, you know, it's no longer, so you can't get any grease in. So that's, that's one reason why I had to pull this apart. It's because of, you know, that seemed odd to the gentleman who owns this. Yes, sir. Oh, scratch your butt. Scratch oh, your man. Butt. Scratch your butt. Oh, scratch your butt. Your best buddy. Scratch your butt. <laughs> Hi, Lulu. Yeah, you got a friend over. That means extra petting for you. I think I'm going to call it on this one for a minute and then, uh, you know, focus on the other one. Oh, you got your buddy. <laughs> She's like, here, let me clean your face. Here, you got something on you. You had French toast for breakfast. Yeah, what'd you have for breakfast? French toast? <laughs> I don't mind. My turn, straight my way.
Um, well, there's no belt oh, here. No, belt. no, it's not a belt groove. I don't know what the, it's got a big old, if it is, it's got a big old weld, crazy weld bead in it. What, what was it? How did that turn? Well, this whole thing, this is belted down. This is attached to the whole thing because it goes through there. And as it turns, this goes down in the big old pot or whatever tank and it scoops and self feeds. So I'm guessing, because it's got that thread in there, that it's just yeah the it, it, yeah the force of it the force of it, it, it yeah it keeps it keeps itself tight huh. So these are completely disassembled, and I want to say a big thank you to my buddy Matt. He had he had to go. Big thank you to him for helping me get these apart because it was a lot easier with two folks than it would have been with just you know me, myself, and I. Just, Matt's the type of guy who, you know, he doesn't afraid, not afraid to get dirty, not afraid to break a sweat, put in whatever effort it takes to get the job done. Doesn't complain. He's he's just an awesome dude to work with. We work together eight hours a day, five days a week. Pretty much know what each other's thinking. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so. I appreciate his help. Now that these are apart, what I need to do is I need to install a drain slash fill hole in this. It needs to be able to accept the one inch balls at least, one inch steel balls through the hole. It also needs to drain the tank or the drum, whatever you want to call it, of this ball mill completely. So I was given a couple of options, things that were okay with the person that owns this for me to do. And now let me show you what I've decided to do what I think will work the best given the tooling and stuff that I have and not give me any problems. So let's do a little fabrication, a little bit of machine work and get this flange face finished up. So I've got two options. One is to tap a hole in the face of that big flange, two inch NPT. That's not the easiest thing to do. If you've ran one of these by hand, I don't have a machine that'll run it. I don't even have a tap wrench. I've got a big one, but it ain't big enough to hold that thing. So I've decided against, because well, for one, I'm here by myself. I can't get a 360 degree rotation on this tap because that pipe has, or that flange has a big pipe sticking out of the middle of it. So I've decided against putting a pipe plug into, in there just because, because I think it could run into trouble 
uh, trying to tap that thing out. So what I've decided to do is make a custom flange. It's about four and a half inches in diameter. It's a four bolt flange. It's gonna have a feature on it that we'll discuss a little more about in just a second. You normally wouldn't see on a flange, but this one's gonna need it. And I'm gonna make it out of this hot roll plate. Just mild steel, hot rolled, quarter inch thick. So let's go ahead and get set up, cut out our flange, you know, get started uh, making this, and then we will get set up and drill our hole, our two inch hole, that's what we're gonna do, in this uh, big old flange. That's gonna, be, that's gonna be a tough setup to do. So to cut out our flange, we're gonna use the Hypertherm XP45. Man, talk about a unit. This thing makes cutting steel just effortless. This, it's awesome. So I've used this uh, plasma torch a ton and it makes things like this just super, super easy. It just blasts through a plate like this, just no problem. And I've got the circle cutting attachment, which is nice as well. You can get a really, a really nice, nice uh, circle with this attachment. fire blanket down. This will catch all the slag that this thing blows out. Or catch most of it anyway. We won't be able to go, we'll have to reposition because we'll hit our uh, thing there. But I mean you get the idea. Oh, man. Perfect. Sneezing, little girl. I know that old plasma cutter stinks, don't it? We need to get our dust or our smoke collector or smoke filter thing unit on the wall hooked up, don't we? <laughs> I know we do. So, here's a quick look at this circle cutting attachment. It comes with a magnet. This is the actual hypertherm it, you know, unit itself. So, you don't have to make a center punch on the work where you want to cut a circle, you can bolt these wheels to the sides of this unit to hold your torch a certain distance off of your work and maybe to trace along like a fence. If you want to cut a straight line, you can mount it to the front uh, depending on the access that you have. All sorts of different things, even suction cups. You know, all sorts of different ways to, to get a circle cut. I think that's a pretty neat unit. So everybody has seen the 90 degree torch. This is what you always see, common. But probably not everybody's seen a straight one. It's just an accessory for the plasma. So you can take the consumables off of this, the torch ends, put it on. And if you were cutting on a frame rail or something, let's say you got a leaf spring shackle that's in the way and you can't get up to where you need to because of the shape of this one, or you're doing gouging or something like that, the straight torch and they give you a little more, better access. Pretty neat. So I am getting excited. We are in the home stretch now. You can see the shadow of the inside of the drum here. You can see where the gasket runs. 
I can see some of you looking at that thumb. Why has it got a bunch of wrapping on it? Because I'll tell you why. I just about sliced it completely off just a second ago with my handy dandy pocket knife cutting a zip tie. How many times do I have to do the same thing? How many times has this thumb got to be cut? Before I decide not to use my thumb as a push device into a sharp blade. This is a brand new blade. Cut the zip tie quite nicely. And also did my thumb as well. It happens when you do this type of work. You can see the shadow of the inside of the drum. You can see where our gasket runs. Inside of the drum, there is a lip here. The customer wants this thing to drain completely when the hole that we put in here is at the lowest point. So I need to measure up from the inside of that lip there, about an inch and three quarter. We'll pilot drill it. You know, and then when we put a two inch hole in here, that should give us about, I don't know, quarter inch or so overlap of our edge. That way, you know, we're below the lowest point. Our hole is the lowest point and should let, allow this thing to drain completely. That is the idea. Now, I've got a set of drill bits on the bench that were brought to me by a viewer. Really neat set that I have never used a set of drills like this ever before. And I want to share them with you and we'll use them for the first time uh, together. I think it's just a nice thing to do. Uh, let me show you what we got and, uh, you know, we'll get set up. Get a hole in this thing. Knock this project out. So here's the drill set that we're going to use made by APT and it's a multi-tool set made in the USA. One inch shank heavy duty, in case you didn't know. This is the E-Series. Nice case. Comes with uh, pretty nice instructions. That's laminated. Yeah. You know, of course it would be. Uh, if it's you know, as old as this is and looks as good as it does. This one's got a Morse taper number three shank, so that'll fit right in my drill presses. It's a spade drill set, just in case you didn't know. So you can see all sorts of different size spades, and it's got detailed instructions on how you should step up in hole size. These are arbors, so let's say you wanted to drill a hole two inch or larger, you know, you'd put this in there. If you had a hole that was two inch, and you wanted to open it up, you'd put this in there. This would register inside the hole, and then your bit, which would be larger than this one, maybe something like, yeah, I don't know. You get what I'm saying, I think. So that would go like that. It would pile it in the hole, and then you could open it on up. So there is a detailed instruction on how to step up. So the first thing that I'm going to do is just drill an alignment hole. Just like I did in this flange with this drill. That way I can assure that my two inch hole that I put in here is center with the center of this flange. So once I drill that hole, I'll slide that drill bit in. I'll use uh, some trans expandable, really cool expandable, uh, 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 what are the, I can't think of the name. Transfer punch. Took me a minute, but I did. Transfer punch. So I'll just drill that hole, slide the drill bit down through both, use my transfer punch, boom, boom, boom. And then I can drill my one inch hole. Then I can go in with that spade drill and put the two inch hole in it. That's the plan. I know. There's a burglar. There's a burglar. I know. I know. There's a, bur there's a burglar out there. Let me check. Where's he at? Is there a burglar? Oh goodness. It's nobody. 
So check out this old set of expanding transfer punches. See how they work? I'm gonna get this big one. I'll show it. Be a little easier to see. You put it in the hole. You expand it by turning this knurled knob. See how that gets bigger? So it fit any hole within the range sizes. They've got them marked here inside. This set comes with three. So you expand it to the hole that you wanna get to the center of. And then it's got the center punch built in. So you just smack that with a hammer. So you can get to the size of you know, any hole, really, within the sizes of these. You just put it in the hole, expand it to its tight, tap it with the tap it with a punch. Move on to the next. Spacers fell out. Oh man, I'm I'm curious to see how that spade drill does. Is it going to do good or is it going to just go crazy? I don't know. We will find out. So 85 RPM, it's in the slowest speed that it'll go, which I wish it would go slower than this for this size of bit. I'm going to use liquid, some water-based coolant, just go slow. Hopefully this goes well. probably should have stepped this hole. You know what? I can I can do that and I'm gonna. I'm gonna go with a much smaller bit. Well no, because then I won't have a pilot. I could change bits progressively.
do a bunch with that, not least with that angle on the cutting edge. So I got my flange almost done, but I need to drill a larger hole in the center there, and I'll show you what it's for in just a second. Got these holes drilled and tapped. That is a pretty nice looking hole for the way that it drilled. So I'm gonna bolt this on here, and then we'll get set up in the drill press, and we will punch a hole in this, and then we'll make the other the other part of this thing. I got to, uh, also got to um, uh, do a little bit of welding. So got a quick story. I guess I've learned my lesson once again with the U.S. Postal Service, and that is to only ship items, at least from my area, in steel boxes. That's the only way anything will ever show up undamaged. I shipped um, some extended sockets that I made for a good friend of mine. It took me about a day, full day, day and a half to make these things. 13 pounds worth of super extra extended sockets uh, that I've made in the past boxed them up. I could have used a better box. I really could have, uh, but I packed it full of cardboard, um, packed it with bubble wrap. Everything in the box was really good and snug in there. When you push down the lid, it was super tight. Wrapped it multiple times in several directions with tape, and I was like, well, that should be sufficient under any normal circumstance. But when you are dealing with the U.S. Postal Service, at least here in the last few years, you better just weld you up a steel box and uh, just weld it shut. That's fine. That's the only way your product's going to make it uh, in one piece. So unfortunately, the box showed up to my buddy uh, completely empty. So I really, really hate that. That, you know, kind of bums me out. But it does happen, and I will never use the U.S. Postal Service again unless I, you know, completely build a just a bulletproof box because otherwise it just has a poor chance of making it. So let me show you what I got to do to finish this thing up. So I drilled a hole in there, and that hole is for a plug weld, so I can weld a slug of this two-inch material to the back of this flange, and that way when it's bolted down, it completely fills this hole because this is a ball mill, and it's going to rotate a gazillion and a half times, sometimes weeks at a time. We don't want the balls... This is what I was asked to do. We don't want the balls to get in the hole and potentially beat up the leading edge of this, and to do that, to keep that from happening, I'm going to turn down a slug of this material, about 200 thousandths off, so this fits in there. It fits in there good right now, but that would definitely get corroded, jam in there, and you'd never get this off unless you put some jack screws in it. So I'm going to turn this down, and there was also talk about potentially coating, putting a, a anti-corrosive coating on the inside of this drum. So I am going to turn this down so it is just a loose fit inside of this hole, but completely fills it. So. What I'm going to do, go to the lathe, turn down a section of the, face it, turn down a section, that way it, it's 
you know, fits in there loose, it'll be just slightly longer than this is thick. So maybe a hundred thousandths longer. So when I put a gasket on this, it pretty much comes to the other side. It can be a little recessed, it can be a little bit proud, but preferably a little bit recessed. And uh, you know, that's it. That's the goal, is to keep this from getting beat up and to fill that hole. So let's go over the lathe, face it, turn it down, slop it, slop it off, weld it on, make a gasket, bolt it on, and we are done. So don't stress out over using these as scribes. They're complete garbage. So that is about a, a one inch, one hundred thousandths long. That's just a reference mark. I'll turn slightly past that. That way when I cut this off, put it in lathe and flip it, I can just turn it down, you know, by measuring it. But that's just something to work to. So I'm going to turn this down, pull a couple hundred thousandths off. Just as soon as I hit, right there, zero, pull off a hundred and then a hundred more. It's a hundred thousand paths. So to the saw, Batman. So a viewer of the channel stopped by the other day and he brought me several things. And one of them, his name is John Rans Ransdale. And I really appreciate what he did. He brought me, it's a light duty saw stand or work stand, you know what I'm talking about. So if you've got long pieces to support in the saw, I didn't have one of these. And I've been gonna make one, you know, forever, just never have. And this one is adjustable. You can see, plenty good for the stuff that I do. My only concern with it is that it is about half of an inch too tall for this saw. So I, luckily it's got feet that are extended enough to where I can just lop, you know, an inch or so off of those, then adjust it to the height that I need for my saw, and boom, I've got myself a nice uh, stock stand, work stand, whatever you want to call it.
So my saw's starting to hop a little bit. I bet you this blade's close to breaking. Hopefully it makes it through this work. See what I told you? It just broke. Hmm. So instead of welding up a blade for the little horizontal saw, I'm just gonna finish this off in the big, the big do-all vertical. So be careful with round stock. It'll not careful. It'll spin it. Spin it out of your hands, just like that. Not too bad. You got to be careful how you push on a saw, but trust me, you can push as hard as you want on this one and you're not gonna bog down the, the electric motor. You may you know, lose a finger, but you ain't gonna bog it down. So there's our slug, fits in there. You know, it's a little proud, that's fine. Once we get our, you know, we'll have a gasket on here that's at least a couple hundred thousandths thick. So plenty of room, so they can do a coating on this, but yet it still should not jam up, at least that's what I'm hoping. So what I'm gonna do is bolt this guy on here. And then flip it over, flip the whole unit over, center it up, and then just come in from the bottom side and weld it up. So while you guys weren't paying attention, you just missed something really exciting, and that was a bat, like a big bat. Probably, I don't know, big as far as I'm concerned. Um, six, eight, six, seven inches maybe across the wingspan, you know, pretty good size doing its laps in here. I don't know if he come in when I opened the door or whatever happened, but he was making this lap after lap and I was like, oh, how am I going to wrangle this guy out the doors? And, uh, you know, he was swooping down like oh, so, so close I could feel the wind from this bat. And uh, I tried to get the camera set up real quick because I wanted to show you guys, but this bat, was sly and he ended up squeezing out a crack in the door so you missed him and I, and I apologize for that that's the way it goes sometimes you just miss bats and stuff um, I don't see them that often although they're all over the place here you just don't see them that much because I don't look for them but anyway now that we are almost done all that is left is to weld our slug that I just turned down on the lathe I need to weld it to the small flange that we made so now we need to squeeze down and get up under this thing after you know get it good and centered put a put a good spot weld on it and then i'll take it off take it to the bench clamp it together real good and weld the daylights out of that hole so it becomes one piece basically and then this part of the project of this project is complete so i want to do something really quick before we start welding because i'll forget otherwise because it's on my mind and that is drain the water out of my torch tig torch cooler I want to drain the water out of it because it has straight water in it right now and i want to put this low conductivity antifreeze in the unit because it's supposed to get pretty cold not that it gets really below freezing in here but it gets close at times and I don't want to risk damaging my uh, tig torch or my water cooler just because i didn't want to take the time to drain out the water that's in it the reason it has water in it is because I just got this unit together about a week ago. Um, I just was using an air-cooled torch. Air-cooled, but it's not air-cooled. It's actually argon-cooled or whatever shielding gas you're using. That's all I was using on this machine. And to be honest, I think they're, they're fine, but they're also a hassle in a way because you can only weld for a you know, short period of time if you're welding at high amperage until the torch gets super hot. I'm the type of guy who likes to use as little shielding gas as possible to get the job done because I'm cheapskate. And an air-cooled torch is not cooled by air. It's cooled by the shielding gas that flows 
through your conductor cable and around, around the conductor that's in this hose. That's it, one, one lead. This is just an on-off button. Air cool torch right here. What I was using, nice a CK torch. But I had in my arsenal laying uh, in the cabinet for a long time, uh, this uh, Weldcraft, it's a, uh, it's a water cool torch. And I wanted to hook it to this machine. So I did it, I ran it, welded with it, just with water in it and to test for leaks and stuff, it did great, but I've been procrastinating and not change, not changed it out yet. So that's what I want to do super quick. Um, you can just, in case you don't know, why would you want an air cool torch versus a water cool torch? A water cool torch, you can just, you know, weld on. You don't have to stop and take breaks. Um, they they stay a lot cooler. Um, they're you know, just, they're just nice. I like them a lot better simply because you can just rock on. You can still run a small amount of gas. It doesn't care how much gas you use. It doesn't take that into account. It really, as far as cooling the torch, uh, you know, you use a, a cooler for that. So this is a pretty nice Coolmate 3. Uh, my buddy Al picked this up at an auction probably a year and a half ago, and I'm just now getting around to getting it all sorted. I love it. Works great. But I got to get the water out of it so I don't let it freeze and damage. So you get a bunch of welders stuck together and man it is a spaghetti mess so this is cool water out goes in to the tick torch and out i'm going to do pull off this one here yeah that's the hot water return and that's a left-handed one so and then i'm going to stick it in this bucket now you can already see the little uh indicator there spinning so let's turn that on you can see that that's moving a lot of water uh, through. It's not indicating, but well, because it's not flowing through the torch itself. But that moves a lot of water through that torch head, and you can imagine how much heat that this that that amount of water can pull away from that tick torch. That's why they just work so good. So as soon as this thing starts spitting and sputtering, I don't want to run the run this pump in here dry for very long, but. Uh, I just want to get it to where it's, you know, sucking a little air, and then I'll fill it, fill it up with the, uh, fill it up with the proper stuff. For the life of me, I cannot pinpoint what this resembles. So all this cooler is is like a little positive displacement uh, graphite veined pump that has an inlet, an outlet, a reservoir, and a small, I don't know, it's about the size of a heater core on an old vehicle or something, a little radiator with a fan that blows through it. I think that, that's, all, that's all it is. It does have a flow indicator, which is nice, and it has a, it has a particulate filter on it as well, which I'll, I'll clean that out also while I, do this or after I drain it. This thing just keeps going and going and going. Kind of reminds me of a night when you had maybe a little too much to drink. Oh, there we go. So we don't want to run this pump without too long without water in it. Not a good idea. I uh, have a lot of experience with this type of pump and it does not like to be ran dry. So I'm going to take off this flow indicator. Just let this water, it's just water, pour out on the floor. Oh, just throw that on the ground. And, uh, you know, try to get as much out of this thing as I can. So there's a look at the stuff that we're using. So TIG, MIG, plasma, resistance, induction. It's just a welding antifreeze, probably the same as about everything. All weather protection, low conductivity, antifreeze slash coolant. Hmm. Well, this stuff's it's clear as water anyway. So drink up a little TIG cooler. What little bit of water's left in this thing? We'll hurt a, we'll hurt a flea. One gallon. Ha, 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 ha. 
just turn it on. There she goes. Getting the air out of the system. Flow indicator is showing flow. Cool well anyway. Really a job for the MIG, but I'm not gonna get set up with it when this is ready to rock. is tacked. Now I can just take it off and uh, flip it over and we should be we should be good. Now I can put this in the vise, get that clamped on real good and just burn that in. So this torch barely even got warm. You know, 188 amps, plug that whole air cool torch would have been noticeably warm just from welding that long. So, thumbs up to the water cooled setup. You ready to make a gasket, little girl? Huh? Should we make it? Make it out of this? Yeah, does that work? That's Teflon. Is that good enough? Okay, that's what we'll make us a custom gasket with. This is actually a piece of uh, eighth inch PTFE, maybe just a little bit hard for this to seal. I'm not 100% sure. You know, it's going to be one of those, you just have to try it and see. Uh, this is actually a drop from a much bigger gasket, just a piece of waste from a much bigger gasket that I, you know, cut some time back. I just didn't throw it in the trash because this stuff is not super cheap.
it's going to be just absolutely beautiful. Just clean everything up really good. That fits absolutely perfect, and that slug is almost flush with the front face, so I think that this is, this is good. I've got more work to do to this, but I don't have time to get into it in this video. But what I set out to do in this video, I did finish. And like I said, I appreciate my buddy Matt's help on this, getting it apart. That was kind of a struggle. That, that stuff was on there and had been on there for a long time. So getting it apart, you know, big deal. So thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Also, I want to apologize for my absence from the channel. I know I've done this before, but I've had a lot going on. No sympathy needed. Please stop typing, you know, all of that we understand. I know that most of you do. I am a family man like everybody else. I've had to take care of myself. I've had to take care of my family. We've got a new granddaughter that I've had to, uh, you know, me and my wife have had to adjust and change our schedules. And my work has changed, uh, nine to five, like everybody else. Also, like so many of you, leave work at dark and, uh, you know, get home at dark. And I'm really looking forward to the change in season that is really, it's on the way. I'm seeing little buds popping on the tree limbs and stuff, and that is exciting for me because I love spring. So I'm really looking forward to that. Now, maybe in the next video, we'll get into this and some of the other things that have changed around the shop. I am super excited to share with you all the things that you know, have been going on around here. So that is it. Thank you for watching. Viewers, patrons, subscribers, anyone who's helped me out at all at any time in history or will help me at any time in the future, you are appreciated. Thank you for watching. So that is it. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time.